miraculous things in the life of individuals. We all have a story. Do you, do you know that, that you have a story? That one person, thank you, John. Appreciate it. somebody. <laughs> do this. If I want to be treated like this, I'll show up at my own church. But for here, I'd like a little more cooperation, please. No, you have a story. Everybody has one. And your story is uniquely yours. They didn't Jesus say that the, uh, you know, our responsibility were, was to be his witnesses. If you understand, that was, the purpose of the Holy Spirit wasn't so you could talk in another language. The primary purpose was so you could say things that you could identify as true that God had done. And the witness is your story, but it's also uh, being there, which is quite delightful, and hear and see the stories of what God does in other people. And so what we're going to do, we're going to share it from three different point of views. One of the point of views is a person who's going to be here and tell you, here's my story. I, I'm here to witness to the miracle working power of God and how he's transitioned to me. And then we're going to see uh, another story. Uh, of someone who uh, has on the back of his head, his head shaven, tattooed, and his name for years was Dirty White Boy. That's who he was. But I want you to see who he was and who God transitioned him to be, the miraculous power. And then we're going to hear another story of somebody who faced some unbelievable tragedy but could testify of God's goodness. So the purpose of this isn't just to all of you ooh and ah and say that's wonderful, but we want it to be an encouragement because at the end, here's where I want to roll back. The people you minister to have stories, and we ought to take time to hear their story. I actually walked through and say, what's your story? I may not know what that is. I want, to, I want to draw it out. How did you come to Christ? I've done it with some of you while you're here. Where, where'd you come from? Because... When you understand people's story, here's what it does. It encourages your faith, but also you'll run into other people who are in the midst of a very big struggle. And if you've got a long list of people that you've heard their stories, you can say, hey, go talk to Joe. You need to hear what God's done in his life because he can do it for you. So that's where we're going to finish up. Uh, we have, uh, if you haven't met him yet, this is Josh, a man deep in trouble with his wife, but that's another session. And then uh, Eric Myers, Eric and Leslie are in Troy, Montana, and dear friends. And I'm going to have Eric start out with, uh, with the first story. Oh, you got one. What this Does is. it work? Hi. I'll just talk to you. Pastor Stu called me a few months ago and asked me to give my testimony. And initially, Pastor, I was like, I would rather sit up here and preach than tell you about my life, especially before Jesus, because there's some pretty rocky spots. And so I began to pray about it. He said, I need a title. And, and I said, I have to pray about the title uh, I, because I don't give titles well at all. In fact, if I were to give a title to this, it would probably just be uh, my testimony, which is super exciting. So uh, I did, I, yeah, right? It's super exciting. I, I did come up with a title, Life in the Fast Lane, and it just really paints this picture of how fast God has moved in my life. I mean, I'm, I've only been a Christian since 2010. And yeah, right? And some of you can relate. And in 2015, I was named, I was already, the Lord was already steering me in a direction to be the senior pastor of Troy Christian Fellowship. So five years as a Christian, and I'm like, I, I don't even know how to be a Christian yet. I'm still working on my prayer life and my devotional time. And, and, and so it was life in the fast lane for sure. So let me back up and just tell you, I'm going to try to rifle through the stuff that was pre-Jesus because it's, it's pretty bumpy. And he's given me 20 minutes to do this, and I'm hoping to do it in about 10 total. I was... Raised in a conservative Catholic home. And my parents did a great job of taking me to church every single Sunday. I was athletic. I was well-liked. I had a lot of friends. And those friends, they would lead me to partying and a life of 
drugs, recreational drugs, and alcohol. And that would kind of become a theme that would carry over into my 20s and into my early 30s. And then because of the party scene and everything else that was happening, women, girls became a thing for me. And I became what, uh, many of us don't even use this language, but, but it's, it's true, There's, there are sex and love addicts, and that's, that's what I became, I became a sex and love addict. And it was, it was extremely difficult for me early on because there was a lot of promiscuity, there was a lot of different partners in life. I would marry at the age of 18, I would enter into the military at the age of 18, and I would be deployed at the age of 24 to a military zone, Kosovo, if you were any combat veterans in here. It was thought to be a peacekeeping mission initially, and it became a full-on combat mission where we earned combat pay and everything else. Uh, I had three boys with my first wife. Um, you got to be, if you were there, two conference, annual conferences ago down in Houston. I, we baptized my, my son I was, and my daughter-in-law. Top five things I've done in my life, for sure. It was just amazing. So I have three boys with my first wife, and the partners and the partying would not decrease. They would escalate. I was unfaithful all the time. Um, and it just sort of set this thing for me that was, you know, I, I, I remember feeling like I was at the bottom of life's barrel. And just, it, you, when you get to those places, you can't get out of it. You keep, you keep trying to fight naturally your way out of it without the Lord. You just try to, you struggle and you're, and you're just trying to really just, from the bottom of the bill, you're just trying to claw and everything you can to get out and you just keep, you know, you keep falling back uh, and you land at the bottom of the barrel again. I would have an affair and end up marrying that woman and then have two more babies uh, with this woman. And then she would have an affair with somebody else outside of our marriage and that would end up ultimately driving that second marriage to divorce. In the meantime, I ended up searching, I was always searching for answers. I was always trying to find who I was and no answers were coming my way, no answers. I tried my luck with Freemasonry. I became a Freemason and at the same time, I actually became a, uh, I, was, I was messing around with and becoming friends with one percenters over in Philadelphia area, the motorcycle gang guys, tough guys, real guys. Uh, through those guys, I met a Freemason, believe it or not, which was, it's mind blowing. If you know anything about the 1% motorcycle world, you don't run into Freemasons in the motorcycle world. But I did, I ran into a Freemason and, and then got linked up with that. I, had, I was working at a Harley Davidson dealership, turning wrenches uh, for people legally. And then we would be moonlighting and turning wrenches to make extra money for uh, the one percenters that were stealing motorcycles and bringing them to the shop and, and I was making money that way. And all of that was happening and all of a sudden somebody shows up and says, uh, do you know Jesus? It's crazy, it was absolutely crazy. I was sitting on my soft tail in my garage. Uh, his name is Tim, good friend of mine. He's actually going to come out to Troy, Montana and preach it. Uh, Troy Christian Fellowship the first Sunday in October, so we're really excited to have him. He's still a very dear friend of mine, but he took a leap of faith and walked across the street as I was sitting on my soft tail in my garage, nine o'clock on a Saturday morning, I still remember it like it was yesterday, smoking a cigarette, drinking a beer, and he asked me, he said, uh, do you want to come to church tomorrow? And I was like, dude, what? No, I don't want to come to church tomorrow. What kind of a question is that, man? Bug off. And, but in the back of my mind, I actually knew that I was going to show up at church. And so I would go out and do all of these crazy things that night. And I was frustrated in my spirit. I remember thinking, like, I want to fight. I want to rumble with somebody. I can't believe I'm going to go to church tomorrow. And, and went to church and, and he spoke on forgiveness. I mean, 
the rest is literally the rest is literally history uh, so we ended up doing men's bible study two times a week and i was i couldn't get you know when 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 Jesus is in you, and, and I don't even know that I was saved at the time. I, I, there, was no, there was nobody that led me in a salvation prayer. There was nobody that came and told me, hey, by the way, this is what being saved looks like. But I, I couldn't get enough Jesus. I, I, I had to go to every event. I, I, I don't understand this generation right now where, where the, the, excuse me, the younger generation right now that doesn't, they, they like want, like it's trying to herd young adults to church sometimes, like cats, like you try to you know, funnel them into church and because they don't have this fire sometimes. But, but for me, I, I, I had to be at church literally every second of my life. I, I just, I had to be. And it was one night they opened up the church for a 24 hour prayer vigil. They just unlocked the church and you signed your name on a little sheet and you came in and you spent time praying. I didn't even know how to do that. So I signed up, I signed up for one o'clock in the morning cause I'm still turning wrenches on stolen motorcycles that I'm, I'm going to be up. And so I'm there and, and I come into the sanctuary and there's a cross and there's a little coffee table thing with a pillow and they were playing some soft Christian music. And I thought the pillow was to lay my head down and go to sleep. So I laid my, I laid my head down and I go to sleep and it's like 107. And at 108, I woke up and I had this vision that I didn't even know was a vision. I thought it was a dream. And in that dream, in that vision, God was showing that I was going to be a pastor. And he was he was hitting on all the hot points in my life. Like I love to hunt. I love to fish. I love to ride motorcycles. I love to, and he was taking me through my life and showing me areas that I had missed him. So 108 comes around, I wake up and I remember I kind of rolled over on the pillow and I'm looking up at the roof of the, of the sanctuary. And, and I, and I said, I said, God, I said, he said, he said, you're going to be a pastor. I said, God, I'm no pastor. Do you know who the expletive I am? Out loud in the sanctuary. And I, and I got up and I was going to go walk out the door. I was going to go push through the doors into the lobby. And as I was walking through the doors, I heard a voice, an audible voice. It was the only time I had ever heard an audible voice of God ever. And he said to me very crystal clear, he said, I do know who you are. And I'm going to teach you how to love people seven times greater than you've spent your whole life hating them. And I stopped and I came back into the sanctuary and I'm looking down the rows of the chairs and I'm expecting to find somebody laying there hiding out. And I go to the sound booth and there's nobody there. And so I burst into the lobby and I found a, I found a flyer with, it was just a bulletin with the pastor's name on there, Tim, Tim Deering. And it had his number and said, call for prayer. And so I called him up and it was, at this time it was like 1.10 in the morning and he answered. And I said to him, uh, listen, this just happened. I had this dream and, and he let me talk. And then he said at the end, he said, it's not a dream, it's a vision. And then he asked me a very, very pivotal question. I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. He said to me, I have a question for you. I said, what? He said, what are you gonna do about it? What do you mean, what am I going to do about it? I, I don't know. I, don't, I barely know how to pray. I don't, what do you mean, what am I going to do about it? So I found myself, I enrolled in Berean Bible College. I got my associate's degree. Around the same time, I was really lonely. And I had, because I had spent my whole life linking up with people physically and, and, and emotionally, linking up with women in my whole life. And I was, it had been a long time since I had been with somebody. And I was facing my second divorce, my, my, uh, my second wife was done. She had had that affair. And I needed some, some women conversation. I, I, I was so tired of talking. It had been weeks and months, and this sounds silly to you, but this is a sex and love addict's life. I was so tired of talking to just men. And so I got on Match.com. True story. I got on Match.com where you can actually pick, you know, on those websites if, if anybody's ever done it. If you found your spouse amazing, if you haven't done it, don't. Um, but I'm on match.com and I'm, and I'm picking Christian, loves kids, loves Christian music, loves the outdoors. And I'm, I'm selecting this person that I'm going to talk to and Leslie pops up 
and she has five kids and I have five kids and I thought that that was hilarious. And the longer story I won't tell, but we ended up getting together and started dating right away. The first night together, we literally laid next to each other and talked the entire night. And I had to work that next day and I had, I had to get on my soft tail and ride 45 minutes or so away. And it was, I was so tired, but I was like, wow, this is amazing. Well, we would end up uh, being asked to lead a ministry at the Assemblies of God Church that we were going to, which is a whole other story. We ended up going to an Assemblies of God Church. The pastor says, I, I want you to lead the young adults. And we're on our way to this chosen 300 where you speak to homeless people and then you bless the meal. And, and so we're on our way to one of those ministries. And the pastor's wife says, well, you guys aren't living together, are you? And we were. And I said, well, of course we are. She, and then she says, well, you're not sleeping together, are you? Well, I have five kids. She has five kids. I turned around and looked. I mean, I have no idea that this is a thing in Christianity. I turned around and I said, of course we are. Like, What? And she says, well, if you ever want to work in ministry and God's calling you both to ministry, it's very clear. If you ever want to work. And meanwhile, my senior pastor, my mentor has not said a word to me. He's just smiling and he's holding his wife's hand. She says, if you ever want to, if you ever want to do this, and I know God is calling you to do this, then you're going to stop sleeping with each other and you're going to honor God. And, and so we did that for seven months. We had planned to get married a year and a half. We bumped it up to like eight months. True story, true story. So we get married, you know, when we found out that we were gonna be together and we knew right away, first time we knew, it, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. On paper, our families were like, both of our families were like, this is the stupidest thing you've ever done. This is absolutely crazy. Don't do this. You're gonna destroy each other and you're gonna destroy each other's lives. And I, I mean, we like to say to people, uh, we, we have the best marriage that I've ever known of. And then I watched three couples sit up here and 150 years of marriage and, and ministry and it blows my mind and I salute you all. I think I want to be just like you. Uh, but I'll, when I'm 50 and when I'm married for 50 years, though, I'll probably be closer to 80 or so because of my late start. 85, actually, I'll be 85. So, but it's achievable and God is amazing. I'll, I'll tell you one more story because it's it's so worth telling and then I'll wrap it up. I know I've gone probably close to 15 minutes or so now, but but to find you, God bringing us to Grace International, I had had a falling out, something weird happened that was very embarrassing on stage in front of like 500 people uh, with our Assemblies of God campus pastor and I, and I won't I love him dearly. He's a good friend of mine. But we had, we had a falling out. It was very weird the way it happened. And I had reached out to Eddie Statton, who is one of my, child, my longest friends, one of my uh, childhood's closest friends. And in, in fact, actually, I can remember Pastor Ed and Cheryl, even though they probably don't want me to always admit this publicly, they're my spiritual parents. Um, and I remember Eddie playing some music on the drums when he was 12. I was there uh, for a couple of those times. And I can remember Pastor Ed saying, son, is that music that we would play here in church? That doesn't sound like, because it had a, a funky beat and it was, it was an old, I can remember that very clearly. And Eddie and I would kind of giggle and laugh about that. But anyway, so I, was, I, was, I had left the Assemblies of God and I had started up this ministry with another guy called Men of Valor. And we were walking around Pottstown, Pennsylvania, Norristown, College, uh, Coatesville, uh, the, the outskirts of Philly, the real bad areas of Philly. And we were carrying a little Bible with us and breaking up drug deals and gang-related activity. And it was just me and this other white guy in, in a predominantly, uh, a very diverse ethnic area where we were always at. From the hours of 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Well, I get this call. This Wednesday night, we were doing this Wednesday night, and it was Pastor Ed, and he says, hey, he says, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of details, but he basically says we have this church in Troy, Montana, and it, it, blew, it blew my mind. I, I had never even contemplated that before, and I said, well, and, and please forgive me if I'm butchering the story, Pastor, but I, I said, how many days do I have to figure this thing out? And he said, well, you can pray about it, and we'll join you in prayer, and we'll partner alongside of you for as long as you need and we're going to be here interviewing for like three days and so if you can let us know like what you're feeling 
if you can let us know what you're feeling, then then that would be really good in in those inside those three days. And and uh, we said no at first. We said no because of our family situation. We still have kids in Pennsylvania, and we weren't able to reconcile being away from our children. And when we eventually said yes, it was so crystal clear that the Lord wanted us to be a part of Grace International, to be pastoring a church. People were coming up to us, random people were coming up to us and saying that they were going to go on a vacation in the Yak, which is, is like 40, 40 miles north of us in, in Troy, like when we were living in the Philadelphia area. And we were like, wait, what? You know the Yak? Like we've only seen it on the map, but this is amazing. And, and so it was just, it was mind blowing how the whole thing ended up working out. And I, I, wa I want to say this to you. I, three books have changed my life. And this is, this is actually where I feel like the Lord wants me to end this for you. Three books have changed my life. The first book was a book written by Erwin McManus called The Barbarian Way. I hope if you have not read that that you would take the time to read that. It was the only book aside from the Word of God that actually showed me who I was. I, I'm not, I, I'm just me. I can't do it any other way. I was once in a play at church and I was asked to play a part in front of 2,000 people and when I came off the stage, my wife was in the back and I said, how did I do? And she said, you were terrible. You can, you can, you can only be you. And, and so Erwin, Erwin McManus, The Barbarian Way, the second book is The Awe of God by John Bevere, which is a devotional, but I've read it three times now and I never read it like a devotional because my brain doesn't work that way. I just read straight through it. He even says in there in the book, in the book don't do this, and I'm like reading straight through it and I'm taking notes. And the third book is actually the book that I'm writing, and it's been a project. It's, it's, called, the, it's called Trench Brothers, and I have many chapters written, and I just finished a chapter called The Devil is a Punk, and when you think about your testimony and where God has brought you, you know, there, there, it takes a look, the, the devil is a punk, takes a look at this chapter, John chapter 10. And we all know that it says in there, in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I, I found it super interesting when I was looking at that because in the beginning of John chapter 10, John lays out the difference between a thief and a robber. And when I first, when I first read that, I thought, well, why, what's the difference between a thief and a robber? Why, why, does, why does he do that? He takes the time to do that. Well, in the Greek, the word thief means that he's going to do it with stealth. And robber means he's going to do it with aggression. And, and so then he says in John 10, 10, this stealthy person, this ninja, that does not honor me at all is going to come and try to steal. He's only going to come and steal, kill, and destroy things. And when, when we think of our testimony, we've all had things stolen from us. We've all had things taken from us. We've lost friends. We've lost family. We've lost. When I said yes to Jesus, I lost everybody. Nobody was like, oh, good, I'm glad you made that decision, except for this family, except for Grace International. Truly. Everybody else was like, whatever, dude. Uh, and so I, I get to thinking about this testimony and, and I just want you to know that the back end of John 10, 10, you all know it. You all know it. You're all preachers. You all read scripture. You all know that Jesus is, but I come that you may have life and live it abundantly. And I think that's where I'm at now. Final thing I want to say is we bikers, we have this thing, this saying call, uh, we, we say, keep the shiny side up. Right? Don't wreck. Don't crash. Keep your two wheels on the ground. Keep moving. Pull the throttle back and keep going. Life in the fast lane. Metaphorically, when it comes to our spiritual walk, what I pray for is that every one of us in here keeps the shiny side up, that we don't crash. That we continue to go forward and do what God has asked us to do and continue to be obedient. Right? The psalmist writes that he both takes care of us, God takes care of those that obey him, and God watches over us that obey him. Obedience is everything to me. And that's where I'm at. And I just, I just praise Jesus that, that uh, I am here and that he's not done with me. And if he calls me to do something, I'll go do it. And it's, a, it's an absolute honor. Josh, speaking of honor, it's an honor to watch you men and women of faith 
that uh, have gone before us, that have done so much for our, for our faith, that I can build my faith on your shoulders. It is, it is one of the greatest blessings that we have in grace. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. In just a minute, I want to show a video, but I want to tell you a little bit about the guy you're going to listen to, because it's a, uh, a pretty transformational life. So um, I was raised in a Christian environment. Thank God for good parents. My personal testimony, I always thought I had to go out, had to get drunk, had to beat people up, had to join a gang, because that's, that's a testimony. Until finally the Lord convicted me, do you realize how powerful your testimony, because you never did any of that stuff. That's a testimony. It saved a lot of hardship, a few scars. But anyway, so that's been my life. And so when we came to Livermore from Southern California, um, I ride a Harley, and uh, the particular model of my bike, which uh, he would know, is the most desirable Harley of all of the outlaw biker groups. This is the bike they want. I didn't know that at the time. It made me feel like I was tough. But uh, I had this bike. And everywhere you'd go, it'd come out of a Harley shop and there'd be three or four red jackets. Red is the color of Hell's Angels, probably the most notorious of all of them. No matter where you are, they're very interested. So, got that. Well, um, had a guy that uh, came to the church one day. His name was Jimmy. And he, his head literally is shaved, doesn't have much up there. And tattooed letters across his head is Dirty White Boy. That's what he was known at. And uh, he... He kind of liked me because of the bike. There wasn't anything else we had in common, but I began to build relationship with him and, and talk with him and begin to find out that his entire life, he has all of his family, he has uncles who started uh, biker charters, and his whole life was that's what he wanted to be as a little baby. His mom would take him to the uh, clubhouse, and he spent his days there. His whole trajectory was he was going to be one of those guys and the worst one of them. And he did. So he became kind of odd that I would have a relationship with him. And try to talk to him and uh, loved bikes, wouldn't talk about anything else. I thought, well, this is kind of a hard nut to crack. So through some, he, he has this girl move in with him. And uh, he has a little boy. And this little boy didn't have a dad. So Jimmy's going to become a dad to this boy. And so they enroll him in our preschool. So uh, Jimmy would come by and bring this little kid and bring him to the preschool. I thought everything was going good till the preschool director called me one day. And she's whispering, Pastor Larry. I said, what's up, Julie? Jimmy's in the classroom. I said, okay. Now, this guy doesn't own a piece of clothing that doesn't have red and white uh, or sleeves. He didn't wear. He wears by. He wears every piece of clothing is a piece of clothing from the club. That's all he's ever worn his whole life. It's got the name on it. Got every, all over his motorcycle. And I said, "Well, that's okay." You, no, no, Pastor Larry, you don't understand. He's sitting crisscross applesauce on the reader rug, and he's reading to the preschoolers. I figured we got safe books. I said, "Well, let him do it." She goes, "No." He uses the F word about every third word. I said, okay, J J go and tell Jimmy he can't curse, but he can stay and read the books. And the, the thing is, his heart began to soften for this little boy. Really took him on as his son. And through some circumstances uh, with he and his live-in, uh, that began to be challenged, and he really got scared. Then he wanted to come and talk, and we'd talk, and here's this big guy as hairy as a chia pet, man. He's just hairy all over. <laughs> He's got tattoos on his neck. He's got the, eye, the, the drops on his head because he, is, he has done the things to deserve that and serve the time for it. And I, I kept trying to talk to him about God. And he says, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear any about that stuff. But let me tell you about my problem. So it was continued. And uh, all of a sudden, Jimmy disappeared. I didn't see him for five years. I didn't know anybody in his life to ask where Jimmy was. Five years, and uh, I hear his bike pull up in the parking lot, and there's a knock. There he comes to the office, and the receptionist comes and tells me, so I come and sit down. And what had happened in uh, part of the culture of the life he had lived for years, he got caught doing something he shouldn't, and it had been five years in the, in the federal penitentiary, California. And he says, but the good thing about it, I, I've been sober now for four years, had his four-year chip. 
I said, great, Jimmy. Well, you know, let's talk about Jesus. He goes, no, 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 no. I got the God thing. Don't have the Jesus thing. Talk about the God thing. Don't talk about the Jesus thing. So recovery, you know, you find a higher power. And that's what he had done. And we kept working and praying and working. And COVID came and uh, we started a couple of recovery groups because all the AA meetings in our region were all closed. And we had some guys who called. They didn't go to the church. I gave them a place to meet and Jimmy was one of them. So all this time I kept working on Jimmy. So Jimmy would do stuff like, I am talking to my body and I'm going to teach myself not to curse. And you better believe I'm going to blankety blank make it. Well, that works, Jimmy. He just couldn't get past himself all of the time. You couldn't have a conversation with him. And he didn't even know he was saying it. That had been his whole life. And everybody he knew, that was their life. And so uh, we opened up church. He came to church just because he's this ultra patriot. And he was coming to church because we were the only thing that had opened up in the city. He was just doing it to, you know, stand there with his American flag. Oh, we didn't let him hold one. And his fist in the air like, I'm showing him I'm going to stand strong. That's the reason he started coming to church. And kept talking and kept praying and kept talking and praying for Jimmy. And uh, one Sunday, he would always sit in the far back. We got a decent auditorium and risers. Far back corner, he'd always stand there and stare at me. I'm just glad he didn't hit me after service. But at one Sunday, at the end of service, I just gave a very simple invitation to people to come to Jesus. That's all it was. I, I'm not real good at that. I don't think I'm good at that kind of stuff, but I just gave one. And to my shock, Jimmy stands up from the back row and walks all the way down, right down in front of me, and he's staring at me. Ooh, good enough. So I prayed for him and led him to Christ. Now, how many, of, I don't know what you think about, I want to get in the doctrine of, uh, you know, instant sanctification and progressive sanctification. This guy needed progressive sanctification. <laughs> he needed a bunch of it. But to keep talking to him, meeting with him and praying to him, and God began to do some things in his life. From his release of being incarcerated, the, the parameters of that, he couldn't officially be connected to the group he had spent his whole life being a part of. Interesting thing, I didn't even know this, this little boy that had come into his life who by now is, I think, 10, he had been grooming his son and taking him to the clubhouse hoping that one day this little boy would follow him. That's all he knew. He didn't know anything else. I don't think he knew about Disneyland. He knew about the club and just continued to work with him and continued to pray for him. So along this process, not only him, but we had a number of people who God just transformed them. So we started with our staff, and that's, you're going to see just some clips at the beginning of this. We call it My Story. And so uh, we have a good tech team, so we set up a, a, a blue screen, and people just come in and talk about what happened to their lives. And I mean, they took My Story. They took Rhonda's, some of the pastoral staff, then others. Then pretty soon people in the church that were really having these dramatic uh, transitions and stories, we just started videotaping them and then editing them down and we started putting on the website. We started putting it on social media because the deal is if you are in a club and you are anywhere in our region, you know Dirty White Boy Jimmy. And so it became a mark of people saying, if God could do that, what's the possibility with me? And uh, what a wonderful occasion when I got to baptize him uh, on a Sunday because that was, he, he had brought some friends. I didn't ask anything about him, but he brought some friends to watch him be baptized. And so uh, I want to show you this clip of, of Jimmy, and this is how we do the My Story things, and then I want a couple comments, and then talk to you about how you can also take the stories of the people that are in your church and use those to glorify Jesus. So just watch this video here for a sec. I started using, I was in fifth grade, I think, and I grew up with uh, bikers around me, drug addicts, a lot of uh, 
just uh, riffraff around me, you know? I had a really good dad. Uh, he was just on the road driving truck all the time. I was supposed to be a truck driver, but I continued my trouble. I was getting kicked out of school real early. Uh, probably in kindergarten was my first time fighting in school. From 13 to 33, I spent in and out of juvenile facilities, county facilities, and state prisons. My mom was super dysfunctional. I hated my mom for a long time. I had so much anger, so much rage that I always looked forward to fights because if I could get in a fight and have somebody physically hurt me, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel the emotional hurt. So I was about six years clean and sober when I found God. And what had happened was, uh, Darian is not biologically <laughs> my son. But he's my son. I've been raising him since he was four months old. From 42, I raised him. Darian was going to preschool here. Me and him were spending a lot of time together. And I remember, you know, it got pretty bad. It got down to one hour a week. I was having a hard time. I would come to come down here to the preschool and I would uh, spend time with him at, on re during recess play ball with him and his friends and stuff. I remember my sponsor and a few people start praying, start praying, and it's like, one day <laughs> I was jogging and I'm like, God, whoever, whatever, I don't know if you're real or what. And I'm praying for specifics. I'm praying for more time with Gary and this, that, and the other. And I go to an AA meeting <laughs> and I hear from somebody, don't pray for specifics, pray for God's will to be done and the patience to accept it. So I start praying for God, your will to be done and the patience to accept your will, whatever it is. That's when I hit an hour a week. And that's when my dad passed away. And I thought, what are you doing, God? Are you testing me? And I said, call it, got a phone call. And I, hey, Jimmy, she says, uh, you want to see Darian? I said, yeah. She goes, you're the best thing that's ever happened to him. And this is where my relationship with my God really took off. From that day forward, Things really changed. I found God the rough way, man. Like, I, did I ever think that I'd be sitting in a church, going to church, let alone believing there's a God? Because I didn't never believe there was a God. Everything was, everything was detrimental. And I've been coming here to church faithfully every week for a little over a year, since November, the year before. And I got baptized. Uh, I don't know that it's anything on the outside that changed. It's what's in here that changed. I try to be more loving and affectionate towards people and understanding. Only thing I would say is that God is good, man, and I didn't know it. You know, and sobriety is good, and I didn't know it. And Honestly, I would never go back and change any of it. I am who I am today in life because of it, all of it. I found God when I was supposed to find God, and I got sober when I was supposed to get sober. And I'm right where I'm supposed to be right now because God wants me here for this reason, whatever it is. I'm Jimmy Hooper, and this is my story. So, um, Jimmy has run one of the recovery groups at the church. The most surprising thing, he volunteered, and he works in the nursery. <laughs> Listen, I told him, you have to wear a shirt with sleeves. No little baby wants to put their head on that Jimmy wear a shirt with sleeves, because that's how he dresses every day. Um, but here, here's the power of that. It, how many people in your church have a story that's absolutely amazing, and you've never even found it? You haven't even asked you got to have people who have a story. And uh, here's a good thing you do. Now, that, that was a production that's done good by our, by our staff. But get an iPhone. You know the quality of camera lenses on an iPhone are better than most any other camera you can buy? Just they can buy a little clip, set it on a tripod, whatever. And here's how they do those. They just let people talk about their life for probably 20 minutes. And there's free programs you can download on your app on how to, how to take videos and kind of put them together and edit them down. 
Uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Find some people in your church that have a story just about God's grace. Doesn't have to be a Jimmy story. Doesn't have to be a story of a guy who was in an area, saw things and did things that maybe we have seen a glimpse of in a movie. That was his whole life. But you have people who have stories. And I want to encourage you. Talk to some people. Find some folks that have a story. Find somebody who'd be willing to share that story. Take some video of them, pare it down, and then post it on your social media. Uh, we show these, uh, we've shown them during offering at church. So people can see what's going on. They understand that. The last bit I want to tell about Jimmy is, uh, Jimmy still goes to the club meetings. He can't wear the paraphernalia and, and so forth. He still goes to them. Because those guys were his friends for 40 years. And I asked him, I said, Jimmy, do they, did they beat you up real bad when you told them you couldn't ride with them? He goes, no, actually, among the club members, they respect people who are now stepping away from the club life. Because guys are saying, I've been in here 45 years and i got kids, I just can't do this anymore. So they're actually respecting them. And he says, there's a lot of respect. He says, I just went to, uh, there's a notorious bar uh, where the president of this group, uh, when he was released from prison, this is where they had his party. It's a real well-known bar. It's about 10 miles from the church. He went there to a club meeting. A bunch of other clubs were there. And he says, you couldn't believe how many of the guys are coming up to me saying, hey, don't stop writing. Don't stop posting your devotionals. Don't, don't stop writing about what God's doing in your life. We need that stuff. We really appreciate that stuff. I said, Jimmy, what would happen if one day... One day, I, I, the invitation would be only through the motorcycle I have. I got nothing else to give. But what would happen if one day I could come to a clubhouse with all those people and be able to talk to them? You know, I don't belong in that environment. There's nothing I have to offer to them except the same thing I did to this guy. You got to know Jesus. I said, what would happen if that happened? And the whole clubhouse got saved <laughs> I, I, I thought he'd look at me like I'm not taking you there I thought it'd be some good he says why do you think I'm doing what I'm doing because I think that can happen wow. so you never know the length or how far somebody's story can be hey amen uh, I was thinking as you guys were talking um, in my garage I have a 49cc Yamaha Zuma moped <laughs> that if you guys ever wanted to take the hogs out on the open road um, you let me know I can't go faster than 35 miles an hour but the gas mileage is phenomenal quite tempting thank you Josh <laughs> just think about it <laughs> well, in the, the true story too true story yep um, so just in the few remaining moments we have before we uh, pray together and dismiss to our final session, which is lunch. Um, uh, some of you, that was your favorite session of the whole thing. Is that, you know, you, I got more of a response there. Um, I want to wrap it up with um, what I think is one story with two parts. Pastor Steve usually doesn't preach the Sunday after Christmas. That's just kind of our, our thing. One of our staff members preaches that, that Sunday. Of course, it falls differently, you know, based on the calendar year and everything. And, well, this year it was the, right at the beginning of the year. And in the days leading up to that Sunday, as he tells the story... He really felt the Lord give him a word, a specific word for the church. And usually at Grace Woodlands, um, he doesn't bring one theme for the whole year and then the next year we have another theme. And uh, we don't, I don't think, have anything against that, but that's just not our, our rhythm. And so, uh, but Pastor Steve, you all know, is very sensitive and tries his best to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and, and follow the leading um, uh, for the church. And so he said he felt the Lord gave him a word 
for that specific Sunday, and it was called The Difference in a Day. The Difference a Day Makes. So he brings the message. It's a good message. Uh, we have a fasting time, um, uh, and through the fasting, that theme kind of lingered. We have what we call revival nights at the end of our fasting time, uh, three nights in a row, and, and we gather for worship and prayer as a church, and usually the auditorium is packed, and, and uh, some of you know we have, every Sunday we have two English services and one Spanish uh, service. Uh, by the way, our, the, our 2 p.m. Grace Latino service um, over the past handful of months uh, under John and Lydia's leadership uh, is just growing and growing and growing and and uh, and it's uh, it's it's pretty incredible to see what God is doing there just hundreds of, of uh, people and lots of new people but uh, we gather English Spanish all together for those revival nights and, and it's it's a special time that theme lingered even more and then we found ourselves in a meeting, actually, with a few people in the room. Howard Kalugian, pastor of Grace New England, he was there. He can vouch for this story. We're in the middle of this meeting. It was supposed to be two days of meetings, just five or six of us in the room. And uh, we were talking about some things uh, that we were going to be doing, some initiatives, some of which he talked about in his session. Uh, and um, we were... Uh, uh, we took a break for lunch, and Pastor Steve and Pastor Stu went and made a phone call, a phone call that Pastor Steve would say had been on his mind for some weeks, but he just hadn't made it yet. They go make a phone call to a lady that represented the ownership of a building um, that was actually um, on, on the Grace property that we had sold years prior, uh, and uh, we had sold it to a medical resort. Um, kind of a, a care facility that bridges the gap between the hospital and home for people who need extended care during that time in their recovery. Very nice facility, 50,000 square feet, um, large, large facility, almost feels like a very, very nice assisted living um, uh, place. A uh, few of you have walked through it. So... Um, we, they make that phone call. They were, were only seconds into the phone call, and that lady uh, who represented the ownership of that medical resort tells Pastor Steve and Stu, uh, we, are, we have closed down. We're no longer gonna, going to be meeting there. We have a few people, companies interested in buying the building, but we would love, uh, she said, I would love for the church to have it, if at all possible. And making a long story short, the long story is pretty incredible, uh, but uh, for time, we go back and forth, um, phone calls and discussions in the middle of our day meetings on that Thursday and Friday. Uh, Friday morning, we walk through the building. Friday goes back and forth um, with everything, and then at the end of the day, uh, Friday, we have an offer put in that day. Um, and we had talked with the banks um, for about $7 million uh, was the offer, which uh, the building's worth, uh, give or take, $20 million. And that, uh, that offer uh, was with an agreement that the bank would just finance 100% of that, which doesn't happen. So we would just begin making payments, basically. And... Um, and we could purchase that building. It, again, it's right next to the church. Our parking lots almost almost meet. They will when we finish our parking lot expansion. So we we make the offer incredible. We go through the process very quickly. We purchase the building. A few weeks later, a couple uh, represents um, a group. Uh, ask Pastor Steve to walk through the building. Uh, they hadn't seen it yet. And then at the end of the tour, they sat down with him and said, you know, we've been praying about this and we really feel like the Lord would have us um, pay this mortgage of $7.2 So the church doesn't have any uh, debt load for that building. And so that's what they're doing. 
They're in the process of paying $7 million um, so that the church can just function that. Because, I mean, that's an expensive payment. And then you have to start doing ministry, right? So now we have bills as, uh, attached to the function of that building, but we can do ministry a whole lot quicker because we don't have that payment and, and the, the weight that, that the debt would bring. So praise the Lord for what he's doing. I'll, I'll show you. If you want to put up, that's the building. Um, and that is now the Cathedral Life Center. We just purchased it a few months ago. And you can kind of just go through the, the Life Center pictures. It was fully furnished, came with everything you see. We didn't do any decoration or anything. We, it, has seven, it has a commercial kitchen um, and uh, dining room space, facility space, two outdoor courtyards. You can pause on this one. It has over 70 rooms. And we're going to combine some of the rooms to make larger apartments. Um, how, here's how we're going to use the building. Half of the building will be what's called Forge. It'll be a pastoral training center where we're going to raise pastors up. We're going to bring them for months in at a time and then send them out to plant churches and take churches and Grace International and lead and do all those things. We'll also be having intensives throughout the year for uh, pastors and worship leaders and youth uh, ministers and everything. In fact, we have our first one this fall uh, for pastors who want to come in and learn how to be counterculture. Maybe you're fired up about this whole situation going on, but you don't have the words or the strategy to be able to affect your community. Uh, for just godly values and how to stand up, how to make the right inroads with uh, in, the, in the political world and all that kind of stuff. We'll be sending information out on that. Or if you just talk with Sherry, our awesome worship leader, uh, after the session, um, she'll get you all the information for that if you're interested in coming. How we'll do it is if you can get there, we'll take care of lodging, uh, of course, at the Life Center, transportation, food, and to make it really easy for us to train pastors up in that way. So can I get an amen for, for that? We hope to, to make pretty great, pretty great moves there. So the other half of the building will be this. Um, and, and that's why you see the bedroom like that. It's, uh, that's an example of one of the single rooms we'll have where we'll have compassion ministries. And we're in the process of building those right now. Um, we'll, we'll have people moving in in the next month um, for this. A portion of the building will be for uh, young moms who are choosing life, women who are coming from domestic violence situations who need a place to stay, um, moms with kids in either a similar domestic violence situation or sh she's, as a single mom, doing her very best to provide but just needs just that little extra help just that little bit of reprieve from just the onslaught of the bills and the, so we can bring them in for a short time and not just provide residence but provide training, provide support, pro to pro provide programs that, that will help them, life skill programs that will launch them uh, into just a new season. And the one that I, I am really, along with the Moms Choosing Life one, Brooke is adopted and we have a tie to that. Um, but uh, I think this is how it is in most places. Um, Texas, when you graduate from the foster care situation, the foster care program in the state of Texas, and in our county at least, um, you're basically given some uh, pamphlets, a check, and said good luck with your life. It may not that's probably not how they portray the whole situation, but we know in our county that's how it works. And in our, the county we're in, I mean, we're, our church is right on the border of two different counties, but the county that we're technically in, Montgomery County, it's one of the more conservative counties in all of Texas, which makes it one of the more conservative counties in the in, entire United States, and, in, and parts of it are also very uh, wealthy. And the fact that that is happening in our county makes absolutely no sense at all. So we're trying to do some things legislation-wise, but we are going to say, hey, we're going to identify those foster care kids that, that truly want to, want to live a life of meaning and 
be productive members of society and go to school and get a job and work hard, but they just need a little extra help to do that. And they need a bridge into adulthood and they need some mentors around them and they, cause they can't go back to their foster family. They, they, there could be relationship, but they can't live there. It's a whole thing uh, without, without jumping through all these hoops. So we're going to provide a place for those young, especially young girls. And, uh, and, and, and we're going to teach them things that will help them launch into their life. So we hope to see transformation. I believe with all of my heart we will see transformation out of these ministries. The difference in a day, the Lord provided a building far beyond anything that I could ever dream of. In fact, it was a personal testimony to me of God's faithfulness because when I was, um, let's see, I would have been 16. I was in Los Angeles on a missions trip, an inner city missions trip, and I truly felt the Lord tell me. It was one of the, fir one of the first times I, I really felt the Lord speak to me um, as, as a young man. And I felt the Lord tell me that I would be a part of um, a dream center-like ministry. I knew my call was to be a pastor and a worship leader and different things, and I didn't know how all that would shake out. And it's something I've kind of brought up and been passionate about over time. But uh, then when this came about, it was almost like the Lord just reminded me. Remember, he works in multiple lanes. It's almost like the Lord reminded me personally, hey, remember that? Look at, look at what you get to be a part of. So praise the Lord for what he's going to do through the Life Center and uh, everything, how that will touch not just our community, but all of Grace International. The difference in a day. Just a couple of months ago, um, I met a man because he showed up outside of my office window early Monday morning waving me down through my window. I was there early, the office wasn't open, and so I went around and opened the door for him. And I heard a story. His name is Charles. He had, a week prior, been uh, in service with his son. It was a young adult. Oh, man. He was uh, so excited. Because a year before that, he had filled out one of our cards at the church and put his son's name on it. And his son's name is Joshua. And actually, I, I'll show you this card. That's the actual card that he filled out over a year ago because he was praying for his prodigal son to come home to... to to uh, Jesus. His son was a good kid, just making some bad decisions. So we began praying for Joshua as a church and, and over, like almost a thousand other kids that people had written down. And then, so Joshua and Charles, they're a part of the service. And during our prayer time, every week we have prayer. People can come up and, and pray with our prayer partners for needs. Joshua, in surprising fashion to his dad Charles, Joshua moves from where they're sitting and goes up and to one of our prayer partners. Charles would tell me he could not believe that Joshua would do that. He's never done that. That was a, it was amazing. In fact, um, after I heard this whole story, I went back and we have a security camera in the back of our auditorium. I just wanted to see if all like the steps kind of worked out like Charles was telling me. And so, if you go to the next picture, the kid in the plaid shirt, right there, his name is Joshua. He's praying with a woman in our church. Who's, her name's Kim. And uh, Kim said it was a very sincere encounter, and he was very thankful for the prayer time, and he went back to his seat. Dr. Sam was preaching that day, and at the end of the service, Pastor Steve felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit to go up and, and give quite a, a substantial uh, salvation response moment. 
he outlined the gospel very clearly and asked if there were anyone in the room who wanted to commit their life to the Lord. Many hands were raised, including Joshua, if you go to that next picture. In the very lower left-hand corner, you see his hand up. He's sitting next to his dad right there. Charles couldn't believe it. Joshua would raise his hand. And Char this, is what we, this is what Charles had been praying for this whole time, for over a year with his church. And then in the next picture, you see Charles reach over and put his hand on the knee of his son and pray with him. They pray together with Pastor Steve. And uh, they were in the second to last row. Um, a woman in our church, her and her husband are leaders. She said through the whole service, the Holy Spirit was dealing with her about the kid in front of her. And she couldn't shake it. And then, she, as she tells me later, she said, and then when Pastor Steve got up and you could tell it was sort of like an extra thing we put in the service and, and, and I just, I don't normally peek when he says everyone's head bowed, eyes closed and everyone raised their hand. I don't do that, Pastor, but I did this time because I wanted to see if he responded. And sure enough, he did. And she has two boys that are just a few years younger than, than he is. And so she's, she was looking at this from a, uh, uh, it's a, you know, this mom, almost grandma uh, view of this whole thing. And so this, this young boy in her eyes was making the best decision he would ever make in his entire life. So she gets a little courage up in her. And, and at the end of the service, everyone stands up to leave and she taps him on the shoulder and says, uh, can I give you a hug? And he said, sure, and kind of smiled. And she would tell me later, she hugged him and gave him like this big squeeze. And she said, welcome to the family. So Charles is telling me all this on this Monday morning. And when I opened the office door, he was in a t-shirt, shorts, early in the morning, sandals, looked very disheveled, his hair was a little bit all over the place, um, and he just, he didn't look great. And he came in and he told me this story of what had happened just a week prior, the Sunday, not, not the day before, but the Sunday before. And he said he was coming here that Monday morning because he didn't know where else to go. He had gone home early that morning and he sat on his couch for 20 minutes and didn't know what to do. And so he went to his church hoping someone would be there. And I just happened to be there early that morning. And he said he was up all night because he was at the hospital waiting hours to identify the body of his boy Joshua, who had been in a car wreck that night. A week after he gives his life to the Lord, he's in a one-car accident on the freeway, goes into a wall. And, uh, and his life here on earth is over. So I sat with Charles for a few hours. Of course, we walked with him through that whole time. Uh, I got to speak at, at uh, Joshua's funeral to his family. I got to take 20 minutes in that funeral in front of a couple hundred people and talk about Jesus. Talk about the gospel. Talk about saving grace. Talked about the whole thing. And I called for a response. And I said, Joshua had this moment. Then he responded, will you today? Because none of us know how many minutes we have left 
here on this earth. Uh, I actually got a letter just a few days ago from one of the family members of, of Joshua uh, thanking me for, for doing that. And she said many of his friends and family talked about the moment in the funeral when they heard the message of Jesus in the days after. As we do ministry, as we preach the gospel, as we lead our church in worship, as we pray for people, as we do all the things that we are called to do in whatever, whatever area of ministry we find ourselves, may we remember that there are people that desperately need Jesus and we never know who is in the room and we never know where they're at in that journey. If they're going through all the stuff Eric went through, if they're, if they're dealing with coming out of everything that the gentleman was in the video and everything Larry has been able to walk through with him, we have no idea if there's a 20-year-old sitting on the second to back row who's about to make the, a decision that is going to impact all eternity and his eternity is going to start in a week. May we continue to do the work we are called to do. May we do so not by our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. When we get emotionally knocked around, may we stand firm on the solid rock. May we lean on each other as a global family. May you lean on each other in this district. May you share ideas and wisdom and help and encouragement and resource. May we do what we are called to do for the time we are here. And watch what God will do as we are faithful to him. Amen? Amen. Pastor Ed, will you come and close us and, and uh, lead us to dismissal however you feel is, is appropriate for today? Thank you, Josh. Let's thank the Lord for these stories today. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Stories of redemption. God has a way. Amen. I just want to thank all of you on behalf of uh, Pastor John and myself for coming to the regional meeting. Uh, next year's dates, if you want to jot them down, will be September 8th and 9th. We've been invited back here to the Dalles by the Clears, and we appreciate that. And so uh, September 8th and 9th, and, and remember that these meetings are open. We'd encourage you to invite staff. Uh, leaders in your church or uh, co-laborers in your city that you feel like might enjoy and benefit something like this, feel free to invite them. And when the registration details come out, pass that along to them. But it's been a delightful time. And I want to thank all the crew from Houston for all their hard work. Let's thank them one more time. Appreciate it very much. And then all of our uh, musicians and tech team and video and all, all of you, we just thank you so much for uh, volunteering and the hospitality group. And finally, uh, uh, David and Bobby, thank you again. We thanked you already, but thank you again. Great job. You make us feel right at home, and we appreciate it. And most of all, we thank Jesus for uh, his call on our lives. Amen. And that he tapped us on the shoulder and said, you go. And we said, okay, tell me where. And, uh, and he assigned us as an assignment. And we will be faithful to those assignments. And believe God for great days ahead. Amen. Let's stand together to have a final prayer. Lunch is ready out in the hospitality area. Uh, Pastor David said it's pretty simple. Just find the, the tables and, and uh, help yourself there to the luncheon. Enjoy some fellowship time together. 
And uh, may God go with you and just bless each and every one uh, as you continue your ministries for the Master. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we have had together. <clears throat> it has been rich. It has been a, a pleasure to be with one another, to uh, see folks we haven't seen for a while, to meet some new people. Lord, thank you again for all those who worked so hard to put this all together. And Lord, thank you for the call to ministry. Father, thank you for the call to, uh, to preach your gospel, to serve in whatever capacity we serve. May we never take it for granted, but may we always be grateful and thankful that God saw us and said, I want you to go. I want you to go. And thank you for those that have said yes. And maybe someone here today, God is tapping them on the shoulder and he's waiting for them to say, Wherever you go, whatever you say, that's what I'll do. Lord, we thank you for it. It is the most rewarding thing we can ever do is to follow Jesus and his call. So thank you for saving us and Lord, giving us all our own redemption story and that we look forward to the day when we can all be together in God's great glorious heaven and all those that we've led the way for to go there. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give